Well, hey, good morning. Good morning, y'all. How's everyone doing? It's a nice day. And I can say that because I'm assuming everybody in Des Moines, Lincoln, Omaha, and Ames in Manhattan are probably having the same weather right now. It's beautiful. Uh, I've been working on my backyard the last few days, and um, yeah, I've been really lucky to have some nice weather. How's everyone doing? Who do we got here? Okay. Hannah Wiggy, what's up? Krazzle, 10, what's up? <laughs> Kylie, what's up? Kylie, thanks for helping me get set up on live stream. Appreciate you. Got Bennett watching here on Facebook. Good morning, everyone. Hope you guys got your coffee. <clears throat> Let's see here. By the way, what... The guy needs to show himself. Who is this guy? He keeps calling everyone dad on all these live streams. I keep watching all of Des Moines stuff. He must be a must be a Des Moines guy. I'm here this morning, son. Who is this guy? Reveal yourself. Anyways, today we're going to be doing a, a devotional from 1 Peter. It's going to be from um, the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. The title that I've been given is The Thought life. Jacob Friesen, I see you. Who else we got? Brian Miner. What's up, Brian? Got some people coming on. Okay, here's my question for you. Uh, I do have one question for you guys, and it's uh, it's been on my mind as of late, and I wanted to get you guys' feedback in the comment section below, and before I start my devotional, and when you guys are changing your toilet roll, this is an important question. When you guys are changing your toilet roll, do you guys have it roll top down or from the bottom up? And that's all I'm asking. And I know I know what you're thinking. I'm not I'm not naive. I know this is a controversial topic. You know, battles between roommates have been raging since people have been wiping, uh, frankly, uh, over this topic. But I think in the Christian community, we need some unity here, and I think we should all roll our toilet paper. The same way so I, re I really need your guys at top down thank you Kiki thank you um, yeah it's important guys this is uh, this is an area that uh, there's a lot of division in the church right now and and we need to be rolling the same way if you know what I'm talking about um, I mentioned that because <laughs> one thing um, one thing I I've been doing the last few days just wanted to share with you guys what uh, my life has looked like since last Friday. We've actually been potty training my two-year-old. And if anybody has kids, potty training is intense. Um, here's what we did, so I'll break it down. So what we did is Friday morning, we woke up and we had Sterling, my son, he's two, and we, we woke him up and said, Sterling, it's time for you to throw away your diapers. So we got a big trash bag and we had him throw away his diapers as like this symbolic move and we had him take the garbage out to the garage and and we said Sterling you're such a big boy now you don't need diapers anymore you're gonna be wearing big boy underwear and what we've been doing is we re we've been quarantining ourselves for the last four or five days since Friday and we've been potty training him nonstop it's like a blitz of potty training and every time he has to use the potty we give him a skittle and as he's, we're trying not to prompt him by saying, Sterling, do you need to use the potty? But we've been saying, Sterling, if you need to use the potty, make sure you tell us because we want him to have the decision uh, and we want him to kind of prompt himself. Anyways, long story short, we've been self-quarantined in our house since Friday, peeing everywhere. There's pee everywhere, there's poop everywhere. He's pooped his pants and he pooped his, um, his little underwear now, but he's getting the hang of it. He's actually doing pretty good now. Um, I know Mike, just yesterday shared an, um, on the life of purity. It was really good. I got to watch it. And I'm going to be sharing again on the thought life. So if you guys have your Bibles, open with me to First Peter. We're going to be in chapter 1, starting here in verse 22. And then we're going to go all the way through chapter 2 to verse 3. So I'm going to pray and we're going to get started. Thank you, Lord that you want us to change, you want us to grow, that you don't leave us as orphans. You don't just save us from a negative 10 to zero in terms of 
I saved you and, and I'm done with you and I did my part, but no, you take us from a negative 10 to a positive 10 and you sanctify us and justify us and you will glorify us. You no longer call us slaves, but you call us friends. We're no longer neutral to you. We are now your friends. I just want to say thank you, Father, for what you've done on the cross. And as I think about that, Father, that it would change into action in my life. That the gospel would become a catalyst to change my life. Not me changing my life to accomplish and to meet the gospel. And I ask that that would be our takeaway today in your name, Jesus. Amen. So um, I kind of already um, spilled my main point. That's good uh, because the devotional won't be very long. And as a matter of fact, when I was planning my devotional, I was uh, asking Jacob Bennett. I was like, Jacob, what's the difference between giving a devotional and doing an, uh, a message at the midweek service? And uh, I'll be honest, I still, I still really don't know what the difference is here. But the point is, um, we want to hop in the Word, and we want the Word to transform our minds so we can test and improve what God's will is. So we're going to start here. I'm going to read through our passage today. This isn't going to last long. This is just a short little devotional. But I'm going to start chapter 1, 1 Peter, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for one another, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Chapter 2, here we go. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, every kind, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. And I have some notes here, so I'm just going to read from these. So. So my first thought is, um, this is sort of a warning, a, pre, a, a pre-warning. If you've read, if you opened up your Bible, if you had your computer open, if you had your app on your phone open to Scripture, if you were reading this, one thing that I want to warn you is that this is kind of like a tricky little landmine for Christians who are not as mature in their faith yet. And I want, to, and I want us to be thinking correctly this morning, going forward about these kinds of passages. So I'll be honest, when I read this passage, my, when I first read it, I was assigned this passage, and there was like, and uh, my thought was, man, this is sort of a landmine. I thought to myself, do I need to be producing good works in order to be like justified in my life? And I want to start in verse 22, and it says, Now that you have been purified yourselves, obey the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. And my, my thought was like, why, why would P- Peter, who wrote this book, why would he remind believers that they need to have a sincere love for one another and then instruct them to have a love deep and sincere from the heart. So let me say that again. Why Why would he tell them, hey, you already have this love, now go love well. And what he's saying is, and there's another scripture, it's from the mind, I can't remember the reference, but basically we don't love because we have love inside of us, but we love because Christ first loved us. So what Paul, Peter's saying is, hey, because you guys have understood the gospel, because you've understood that you had no way to get to heaven, you were bankrupt and you were um, dead in your transgressions and then Christ came and saved you on the cross through the finished work of his death and resurrection. Because of that, you now have the Holy Spirit in your life. And what the Holy Spirit does is it's a deposit that guarantees our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. So it's, it's going to live inside of us. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us so that we can have new life when we're dead. But the Holy Spirit also lives inside of us so that we have Christ himself in us. We have the very nature of God. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, um, when, when we were preached the message, you were told that you had to throw off your old nature and take upon yourselves a new nature created like Christ to be, created like God to be true holiness and true righteousness. So the point is, we don't do self-modification and clean ourselves up in order to get to the Father. The point is that we humble ourselves, acknowledge the gospel, and then the Holy Spirit does the work of cleaning us up afterwards. And again, this is a landmine, and it's gonna be an uphill battle for a Christian, a young Christian, or uh, somebody 10, 20 years down the road. It's gonna be a, a, a long uphill battle if we are working 
for righteousness in that we think God's love and in, in grace in our life is dependent on our righteousness. So I'm going to skip a little bit. If you guys want to skip with me, that's great. You can. Skipping to verse 20. We're actually we're in chapter 2 now. So chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, evil, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that you would grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. When I read that, my initial reaction is, oh, this is a list and requirement that I have to live by in order to be justified by God. That's my initial reaction. I don't know why. But my the, the spirit inside as I'm reading these is helping me discern that, you know what? What, Paul, what Peter is saying is that my salvation comes first and then what happens afterwards is my sanctification. And I want to encourage you guys that we have our justification, our sanctification, and then later our glorification. We are justified on the cross by what Christ did and our faith in Christ. We are sanctified by the Spirit and we are, ended, we are going to be producing fruit in our life. And then it will eventually be glorified. And I wanted to read a, a passage here, a few from uh, other parts of Scripture. There's one in John 15, uh, starting in verse 1, and John is quoting Christ saying, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And the, fruit that, and the branches that do produce fruit, he prunes to be even more fruitful. And I won't get to verse 3, because that's the, the point I'm trying to make, but verses 1 and 2, when I read that, my initial reaction is, oh man, am I a vine that's producing fruit? If not, I know I'm going to be cut off. But the point is, is if that's how you read 1 Peter, and if that's how you read John 15, then maybe we actually need to grow and reevaluate how we see the gospel and how we see ourselves in the gospel, right? So what I'm saying is, if our initial reaction is, I'm not living up to the standards of a long laundry list like this in, in 1 Peter 2 of, of throwing off malice and deceit and hypocrisy, if we're not producing fruit, and if you're worried about that, then maybe you should like work out your salvation. Maybe you should test and approve uh, what God's will is for you and remind yourself that, hey, actually, my salvation comes not from my righteousness, but actually from Christ's righteous, righteousness. And the fruit that I produce is only a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Right? Let's read verse 23. <clears throat> so I'll backtrack. I'll do 22, then we'll do verse 23. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for one another, love one another deeply from the heart. Verse 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. I have a few other passages I wanted to quote. One is from 1 Peter 1, 4. So this is earlier in the first chapter. And Peter says that we have, a, we have a, um, an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. It'll never perish, spoil, or fade. In Romans eleven twenty nine, Paul, um, Paul says that God's gifts and his calling are irrevocable, which means our salvation can't be lost. Um, these are there are some landmines for us to think like, oh man, if I'm not producing fruit, and if I'm not living a certain way, then there's no way I can be a Christian. And part of that is true in the sense that a Christian should be producing fruit, right? But there's a reason why there's a worldly man-made religion. When I say worldly, I mean uh, 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 an idea that men and women have all across the world and all throughout history and time that in order for me to prove that I believe what my community is, I have to be living a certain way. So how am I supposed to know if I'm a Jew living in a, a, a city with a synagogue that I am a faithful Jew? How am I supposed to know that my neighbors are faithful? I have to see them at the synagogue. I have to see them washing. I have to see them reading the Torah. I have to see them living out their faith. And if I don't see that, then how am I supposed to trust that you actually love God or that you are obedient to your faith? So there's this, this double-edged sword in religion and in man-made religion thinking like we have to produce fruit in order to be justified. And the point of this passage is that we would think correctly about our salvation and that we would not only rest in Christ, right? Jesus says that I, I give you a peace, not as the world gives. 
a peace that transcends all understanding, not as the world gives, but only that I can give to you. And he says in John chapter uh, 4, he says that if you knew who was asking you for water, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water and it would have become a spring inside of you that wells up into eternal life. And the point is, we have no control over producing fruit for God. As a matter of fact, it says in Ephesians 4, or excuse me, Ephesians 2, that we are dead in our sin and that because God had great love for us in his mercy, he sanctified us and justified us by grace. And so we have no hope of pleasing God outside of Christ, outside of the gospel. And there's no way that we can work our way to Christ. So the thought life, as this is the message is titled, is how do we renew and transform our minds today? What's the date today? March 31st. How do we renew and transform our minds so that we can rest in the gospel today, but also going forward, how can we grow in maturity? If you read the book of Ephesians, Paul is banging this point home saying, we want to grow in maturity so we can reach the full fullness of Christ. And then in Galatians 4, Paul is saying like, oh, how I, how I want to form Christ in you, that Christ would be formed in our life. Um, let's see here. So let's read verse 24 and 25. Verse 24 says, For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. I, I love it. Peter's just quoting from Isaiah 40, verses 6 and six through 8. And what he's saying is, Listen, even your righteousness, even the good things that you do, will fail. They will perish, spoil, and fade. And by the way, Paul, uh, Peter was a fisherman, right? And I don't see any fishing analogies in here. He's using all these like crop farming analogies. Um, and the point is, is like, hey, listen, you guys have something that will bear fruit. It is an imperishable seed. Um, flowers of the field, they, they wither, grass dies. Our righteousness, our, our, our works to get to God, and our hobbies and our um, passions are all worthless. Solomon came up to the same conclusion in Ecclesiastes. Hey, listen, everything is, everything is worthless. Everything withers and falls and fades. The only thing that stands is the word of the Lord, and that, that endures forever in verse 25. So, my call to you guys today, and if you're sensing a... Uh, uh, a bathroom theme here, training my son, which way the toilet paper rolls. Go take a bath today. If you want to renew and transform your mind today, go take a bath. And what I mean is, bathe yourself in the truth of the gospel. Go take 30, 45 minutes to an hour after this devotional time. We're going to be done here in two or three minutes. After this devotional time, go spend some time with the Lord. Go take a bath and soak in the simple truth of the gospel. Someone told me this in the past, and it stuck with me, that the gospel is a pool of water. It's two feet by two feet, but two miles deep. And we need to bathe ourselves and soak in the truth of the gospel because it'll be an uphill battle for young Christians the rest of their life if they don't have a firm grasp of their faith. And what I spoke about here could have been a snooze uh, bore fest for some people because they know this fact. But, but yet, in trial, in times when uh, the waters rise, the winds blow, and the rain beats against the house, some people, if their house is built on sand, the, their house is going to fall. But if your house is built on solid rock, when the, winds ri when the winds blow, the waters rise, and the rain beats against the house, your house will stand. So the point is, is like, uh, this is probably a snooze fest for a lot of us. We know this. We know that the gospel is all about salvation through grace and faith and not by works. But when you're tested and tried, you might think like, oh man, I need to perform. It's time for me to step up. But the point is that you can't step up. Nothing you can do can please God. So my call today is like, and I, I titled this um, little devotional, Time to Grow Up, The Thought Life time to grow up. It's time for us to mature in our faith. It's time to, for us, like my son Sterling, to take off your diapers, 
and to put on your big boy undies and to start using the big boy potty and to not think that we can work our way to Christ or that we can um, um, have any sort of fruit that can please God other than faith, right? Um, I love the end of this here, and I'll just finish with this thought, verses 2 and 3. Like, newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Like little babies, and I have a two-year-old, but I also have a month-old. His name is Vaughn. Um, my wife's doing great. Vaughn, little baby's doing great. And just like Vaughn, he craves pure milk. That's all he can eat, right? He can't eat anything else. And like little babies, I've been a, I've been a Christian for for 10, 11 years of my life, I'm still a little baby. We're all babies. And we should crave pure spiritual milk, this simple but yet powerful milk. Milk is not very complex, but yet it's a superfood, right? The point is that we should crave this pure spiritual milk and that we would grow up in our salvation, grow up in the understanding of the gospel, grow up in the simple nature of the gospel. I would just encourage you guys again, go spend some time with the Lord. I want you to shut your phones off. I know you're either on your phone or on your computer right now, but I want you to, and I'm encouraging you to shut your phones off and go spend some time with the Lord. Go take a bath. Go take a real bath, actually. But whatever you do, go spend some time with the Lord and just remind yourself of the simple nature of the gospel. I'm going to pray. Thank you, Father, for the gospel. Thank you for its simplicity and yet its depth. Um... Thank you that you saved me. Thank you, Father, that uh, my life was full of um, weeds that wither and fade, my grass and flowers that will wilt and have no value in front of you. But yet, your gospel and your word and the message of truth is what endures forever. Pray that we'd give up of our lives today um, and the rest of our lives uh, for you and for it, God. In your name we ask, Jesus. Amen. Okay, that went well. Thanks, guys, uh, for tuning in. Go spend some time with the Lord and go enjoy the weather. I'm sure it's going to be nice today.